My name's Carl Seilstead. I'm a new uh, research assistant professor in fire management uh, here at the University of Montana. And I learned of this work through a very nice, nice article in the Missoulian, our local newspaper here, about six months ago. Um, this is a project uh, that the Confederated Salish Kootenai uh, have been working on for some time now that is, is a wonderful example of cultural ex exploration um, of fire. Our speakers today are going to be Jermaine White and Tony Harwood, and I'll start with Tony. Uh, Tony's the uh, fire management officer for the Confederated Salish in Kootenai. Uh, he's been there since 1979. He uh, received a BA in journalism from the University of Montana in 1975. So I guess there was a time when you could go from journalism directly into fire. That seems like that's changing now, but so welcome. And then Jermaine White, and Jermaine White is the information uh, and education specialist for the Natural Resources uh, Department of the Confederated Salish Kootenai. Um, she received uh, her BA from the University of Montana and a master's in education from Montana State University. She also is, uh, formerly served as the Cultural Resource Program Manager for the Salish Ponderai Culture Committee. Um, the presentation today is going to be on uh, fire on the land. It's an educational project, and it's a project that has just received the National Fire Plan's Excellence and Community Assistance Award, and Jermaine will be in Phoenix next Tuesday accepting that award. So that's a very high honor, a very nice honor, and I turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here today um, to talk about our project. I have a pretty big voice. I think that um, most of you will be able to hear me. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Um, probably a lot of you wonder why um, a middle-aged Indian woman is working on fire, and, and it's really a legitimate question. I, when I was working for the culture committees, um, we, we began a place name study where um, we were looking at places on the landscape. And what we discovered is that we were traveling with elders to places that they hadn't seen oftentimes for 60 or 70 years, but they were places that their elders and ancestors and their ancestors before them had gone for um, tens of thousands of years. And those place names were no longer um, recognizable to the elders. There were place names that were called uh, places like the burned over place. There were places that were the great opening or coming out into the clearing. Those places were no longer recognizable. Oftentimes they were all grown over and um, it seemed really curious to me. And as a child I remember growing up and hearing my father talk about the 1910 burns. You know, we were going to the 1910 burns to pick huckleberries in the North Fork of the Flathead or we were going to the 1910 burns or this was part of the 1910 burns which all occurred within our Aboriginal territory. So I knew intuitively or, or I'd heard throughout my life that there was some relationship between fire and the land. And then I had the pleasure of working for the Culture Committee and I was working um, detailed to Tony's shop, to Division of Fire, and um, working as a resource advisor on fire. And when we were working on prescribed fire, what I noticed was that we would go back the second year or the third year into a place that had been burned, and it was extraordinary to see all of the food and medicinal plants that had returned to that place. And it was beginning to look more like the place that the elders recognized. So all of these things came together. And um, I started talking to the FMO and said, the fire management officer, and said, you know, we really need to do something about education. And um, he said, write a proposal, and I did, and they funded it. And that's what this project is. It's um, a four-part project. And um, before I turn the, um, the details of, of the project and some of the relationship between, um, between um, the traditional culture bearers and um, fire management, I, I'd like to also recognize Johnny R. Lee, who, Johnny, would you stand up, please? Come on, come on, come on. Yay, Johnny. <laughs> um, Johnny is the storyteller. Let me first tell you about this project. There, there are four components. The first is a storybook, uh, a Salish storybook called Beaver Steals Fire. And it's a wonderful story. And Johnny 
gifted us with the, with the telling of that story. And it's beautifully told. And University of Nebraska Press published, um, published that storybook. Tony, did you bring a book? I didn't. Johnny, did you bring a book? Anybody bring? <laughs> anyway, it's a beautiful book. Trust me on this. Um, <laughs> and University of Nebraska Press published it. And the second piece is an iconographic DVD that accompanies it. And it's part of this two DVD set. And it's Beaver Steals Fire. And the third part is this interactive DVD. And I'm not going to talk much about um, Beaver Steals Fire. As I said, it's a coyote story. And we only tell coyote stories in the wintertime. And I didn't get a chance to talk with the elders and see if um, we've had our first um, thunder that wakes up the hibernating animals and whether or not it's time to put our coyote stories away. Johnny, is it time to put the coyote stories away? OK, you guys, sorry. We're not going to have Beaver Steals Fire today. But we'll, we'll tell you a little bit about the project. So um, Johnny, do you want to tell us, first of all, about the, OK. That's fine. <laughs> I understand. Um, we're not going to talk about Beaver Steel's fire today. Um, we aren't going to talk about it till the winter time. But I, um, after the introduction to the project, let me have Tony talk a little bit about his involvement with this project. Yes, as uh, Jermaine stated, it uh, has been a, a project that's evolved over several years. and. And uh, it was one of those things that, uh, you know, it was with uh, Jermaine as a, a, a fire information officer traveling with the uh, FMO or, or other fire folks to uh, uh, meet with a fire team or, or, or to go look and work as a resource advisor with us uh, on the fire line and things like that. And then, and then we started talking about uh, uh, the application of fire, the need to get fire back onto the landscape. And uh, uh, we, all native tribes have a, a basic uh, or baseline uh, history, um, and uh, you know across North America, and and, and the tribes uh, pre-settlement were burning for for dozens and dozens of reasons, and and uh, you know it wasn't just uh, uh, burning for. Uh, 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 offensive warfare and defensive uh, strategies, but uh, primarily as uh, as managers of the land, uh, the natives in North America were the the practitioners of fire, and and the use of fire evolved over uh, upwards to 10,000 years. And uh, with that in mind, we felt that uh, the the Salish and Kootenai tribes, as well as other North American tribes, had a story to t tell about fire, and. Uh, uh, that's uh, right where the uh, project, uh, the idea came up. Uh, we really seriously started working on it. And as Jermaine uh, um, uh, indicated, uh, we, uh, the National Fire Plan came up and, and the funding was available and, and, and we got, received a grant for several years to uh, uh, work on this project. And it, it was based on that story that needed to be told. Um, it was developed very well with the project proposal. Uh, it described uh, the very, very strong importance of, of, of having a basis of uh, traditional storytelling and uh, the production of the book. Um, it, it also said that uh, we have a, a big uh, responsibility to uh, give the, uh, the econo e ecological uh, knowledge, the fire ecology knowledge to uh, all of the age groups, uh, not uh, to the children, uh, to the elders, and uh, also to the people uh, of our age group that are that are making the decisions here that uh, you know may have not seen the change and, and may not understand the diversity that can be provided by fire uh, and, and the problems that may have uh, uh, been offered to us with fire exclusion. Uh, over the last century or so. So so that's how it grew. And then uh, the FMOs became the uh, taskmasters. Masters. We had to watch uh, Jermaine and her budget. Uh, she would bring in, excitedly bring in portions of the project as it was developed. And uh, it took a couple of years longer than expected, but I think the payoff was, uh, <laughs> the, the payoff was is, is that the product uh, is true to the dream. Uh, as created, and, and, and we feel and we're very uh, happy and proud of it. Uh, uh, it's very uh, of, of high quality and applicable to, to 
to all age groups. So with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Jermaine. Thank you, Tony. I I'm going to just go through a little bit of the DVD. I want to move through this really quickly and provide an opportunity for us to have some, some dialogue about the project. When we developed the project, what we wanted to do was combine, we wanted to work really closely with the fire managers. We wanted to combine um, the highest levels of science and technology about fire. We wanted to bring that together with the traditional culture bearers. We met with the elders, we met with our cultural advisors, and we, we f looked for ways that we could uh, build bridges of understanding between traditional knowledge and understanding and fire science and technology and that technology and that was really the purpose and the motivation for this for this project um, so that's a little bit about this um, about the project here's something about the uh, the DVD those folks that worked um, long hours to to produce this I, I just had the pleasure of um, uh, of imagining it and uh, other folks worked incredibly hard. One of the things that, that we wanted to provide for educators um, were a bibliography, a webliography, a list of all the books and articles and papers, everything that had to do with tribal use of fire. And um, we wanted to have curriculum, um, as we wanted to make this resource rich, so we included one chapter in this interactive DVD that has um, uh, has information um, about tribal use of fire. So you can click on this um, and then go here to um, our forest management plan, which is um, a fire and ecosystem management plan. And um, these are all, all hot links. Um, I'm just going to show you a very, very little bit about this. Um, um, about this traditional story. Um, a, a very brief overview. And Johnny, if I get too close, you you just give me the high sign, okay? Um, you see me running up. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. um, in our traditional Salish world, um, fire is a gift from the Creator that was brought by the animals to make this place fit for humans who were yet to come. So that's a very different way of looking at fire. Um, particularly different than many of the Europeans that first came here that came from a built environment, a built landscape, and that came with a Christian background and associated fire with hell, associated fire with destruction. Um, imagine the potent collision of cultures that occurred when um, European Americans arrived here um, to a landscape that was fire dependent and to people that were really fire dependent because our foods, our medicines, our, the animals that rely on those, on those foods in this landscape as well that, were, um, that we were also uh, had a relationship, all were fire dependent. Um, how was that, Johnny? Okay. Um, I, I want to show you just a couple of pages of this book. Um, it's beautifully illustrated. But um, one of the things that I think is, is really, um, really kind of remarkable about this um, and will assist in it being an educational tool for um, particularly folks on the reservation is that you have an ability to listen to this in Salish. You can also read it in Salish. So um, that's good. Um, we he ran out, you guys. <laughs> We're getting a little too close here. Um, I just want to show you this because it's really the foundation. This story is really the foundation of this project and a profoundly important place to it. And if you, a profoundly important part of this project because if you imagine that animals brought fire here um, to make this place fit for humans um, and the last couple hundred years we've excluded fire. Um, let's imagine that it might be appropriate for us to return fire to the animals now. Um, let's think about these stories that the elders have given us. Let's think about the traditional knowledge and understanding that's been shared with us and, um, and think about what our role is um, at this time as we, as we begin to bring traditional knowledge and traditional understanding 
to the conversation about fire. You know, there's been a huge national conversation about fire, um, a, a huge national conversation about fire. But um, it's interesting, I think, that those people that have had the longest relationship with fire and, the, and a depth of knowledge about this landscape um, that voice has been largely excluded. So we felt that we could remedy that by producing really high quality educational material and, and bring a tribal voice to this discussion about, about fire. And I'm just delighted that we have been warmly accepted and that this project has been, um, will be folded into that conversation. We've, um, one of the important things that we did right out of the chute was go and visit with, with a variety of elders. We interviewed elders. Um, we had about, um, we interviewed six elders that are culture bearers. We asked them um, a whole list of questions. And, and then we took about three to five minute um, excerpts from those and, and included them in this. Let's just listen to a couple of these, um, a couple of these, uh, this is Tony Inkashola um, helped us um, interview the elders. When <laughs> Yes, <laughs> 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 to clear a place so they can have grass too and have the place for camping. Mm -hmm. That's why when you're all of all marshal, it's like that. Camping all over the place, a lot of grass. Mm -hmm. We felt that it was really an important part of this project for people to be able to hear the elders' voices firsthand, um, to hear what they had to say about traditional use of fire, and particularly about fire exclusion, what's happened the last couple hundred years um, as fire has been excluded from the landscape. Um, we also interviewed fire managers. Here are a couple of, fam this is a familiar face, Tony, that you just met. Um, uh, Let's see. Let's listen. I think to traditional uses of fire were a huge impact on the landscape of the Northern Rockies. I'm sure it was. I'm not sure all the reasons why the tribes utilized fire as much as they did, but what I've found is the tribes didn't do many things that didn't have a purpose. And I think they saw great benefits from fire and utilized fire a great deal for whether it be hunting, cleaning a site, cleaning a trail, signaling. They could use it for signaling, cooking. Uh, there's just multiple uses, manipulate plants around their campsites, manipulate plants in certain areas uh, for horses, for medicines, for uh, Camus for the bitter, I think they utilize fire for, for a number of reasons. To drive game, uh, I could see it utilized in war, I could see it utilized to assist the retreat, uh, to provide protection to someone that's trying to get away from something. Um, I could see a lot of uses of fire. 
No one was here to put those fires out. Uh, no control lines, no roads. I think those fires burned uh, enormous amounts of acres. We feel really fortunate that we had fire managers full cooperation and collaboration, and I think that's really the strength of this project, the strength of Division of Fire um, on our reservation, and um, one of the strengths we have as a tribe, um, that ability to bring traditional knowledge and combine it with science and technology. Um, you know, I think it's Kodak's motto that a picture is worth a thousand words, and um, I really believe that's true. We. Um, we decided to include a photo gallery. We felt that this photo gallery would provide us some information about, um, about the landscape and really help describe the changes in ways that uh, nothing else could. So we took, uh, this is a contemporary picture, but in all of the rest of these, we prepared um, double images of the same landscape over time. We wrote really brief narratives about um, about that change and what the change represented and how, um, how it was influenced by fire exclusion. Um, you can see a, a profoundly changed landscape. Uh, let's see, this is one of my favorites. Fairly significant change. This is the kind of landscape that the elders described, an open park-like area with big ponderosa pines. Again and again, they talked about what this was like. This is what we see in the same, in the same landscape, and oftentimes significant species changes. Look at the tall grass. Remember Harriet was talking about just 80 years ago, the tall grass that the horses fed on? Um, this is the same area, probably not the, the same capacity. Um, we've also looked at, um, at changes that happen when we have significant fires or what, um, what fire managers call lethal fires. And, and we um, believe that a lot of these fires um, have occurred as a consequence of fire exclusion over time. We also wanted to look at landscapes, what a landscape looked like um, after a, after a non-lethal burn or the kind of burn that happens um, on the landscape that um, moves through the grasses and shrubs but leaves the, the big trees standing. We wanted to be sure to talk about how fire managers use, use fire and, and demonstrate a little bit of that graphically. You know, these guys let me carry a drip torch, but they just won't light it for me. <laughs> I think that maybe after this project, now they'll let me carry a drip torch and light it. I know, he's not saying a word, is he? <laughs> um, the fire ecology piece of this project is really the science primer. This is the this is the area where we talk about fire concepts, fire effects, um, fire regimes. So um, we talk about fire succession, fire terms, fire disturbance. You know, I have heard agency people talk about acronyms, but I have never learned the alphabet soup that I have in fire. It's remarkable. The FMO talks about the NFP at the, you know, at the NWRL, and oh man, it's incredible. It's a whole language unto itself. So we, um, we try to simplify this in such a way that, that it's easily understandable and that the concepts are, are very straightforward. We provide an introduction and um, we talk about what, what that looks like. We've written an essay. Um, about about it. Um, so we also talk about fire regimes. This is really, um, we've tried to describe it, we've tried to map it, we've tried to make this as, um, as easily digestible and understandable as possible. I, I apologize for turning my back to the audience, but I don't know how to operate this computer and, and 
talk to you um, at the same time. So we've mapped it. We've also used photo points. So you can look at what these fire regimes look like on the landscape. And then here we have descriptions of them as well. So you know where, when we talk about fire regimes, where they are in a landscape that's, um, that's easily recognizable. Um, and we've also talked about the changes over time. This is one of my favorite things. This is fire regime changes. This is what it was like historically. There were about 20% in, in about 1850, 20% of the fires were lethal. We had about 50% that were mixed and about 30% that were non-lethal. Look what happens when we move to present. Look at the change on the landscape over time. Um, we also look at fire frequency changes. This is um, about 1850, how many fires were very frequent, how many fires were frequent, and how many fires were very infrequent. Now let's look at what happens over time. Look again, we'll go back to 1850 and then move to the present. Significant change in fire on the land over time. Because the elders have talked that talked to us about this being a fire-shaped landscape. It was really important to look at the plant and animal communities and what their relationship was with fire. So we began with trees, we looked at trees, shrubs, and we listed um, a variety of different um, a variety of different trees. We wrote an essay about what the relationship was between that species and fire, and um, we also provided illustrations as well. And we've done the same thing with animal, animals. Um, you know, what is the relationship between some of these animals and, uh, and fire? So the fire ecology section is really meant to be the science primer. That's, you know, that's the part that we relied heavily on, on fire managers for. The next piece is um, the history section of this um, of this project, and this is um, where we asked the Salish Pondere Culture Committee for help, and um, the historian wrote about 40 essays um, that cover a broad range from um, from all of the changes that occurred over time to um, to where we are now, and the relationship between those changes and the impact they had on people and the landscape by um, by fire exclusion or or fires on the land. This is really um, this is a very meaty, deep, um, very rich component of the of the um, of this DVD, I believe. I know we just have a little bit of time. I wanted to stay there and listen to the drumming and singing, right? but um, we just have a little bit of time. So we've, um, this is, a, as I said, we have about 40 essays that talk about, um, that talk about fire from a traditional and, hi and historical perspective. Um, we talk about the um, the person whose job it was to make fire, um, the relation, the reasons for, for burning. Um, we first of all talk about the traditional lifestyle. Um, we talk about traditional territory and how fire was important in man maintaining that territory. We talk about land tenure, how long people have been here. Um, we looked at, um, at tree rings and fire and fire history. We also looked at the cultural geography. And this, uh, again, this is hugely important because this is the place where we, um, we looked at, at place names and how these place names um, talk about fire. In, uh, these are just a few place names um, across the reservation, um, or across um, the area that's now reservation and just the, the near boundaries of it. Um, and all of these place names describe uh, describe the relationship between place and fire, this, this long traditional relationship. Um, okay, so we wanted to talk about the great changes that occurred and what happened when this collision of cultures began, um, what the relationship was between fire and horses. 
We also wanted to talk about the relationship between uh, fire and disease, um, the great changes that occurred, horse disease and firearm. We felt that that um, fire had an effect on all of these, and and this um, was one of the um, one of the areas where many long essays have been written. And we moved in the history component to the 19th century. We talk about fur trade, fire observations. Um, oh, let me go to this fur trade. Um, let me see if I can find. Um, this is this is a journal by a guy named Peter Fiddler, and he traveled from Buckingham House in Alberta south to Chief Mountain, chief of the, of the Rocky Mountains near Glacier Park in um, the winter of 1792 to 1793, and it's remarkable. I had heard from the elders how frequent fires were in traditional times, but I had no idea until I began to read this journal from the late 1700s exactly how prevalent fire was. From, from November, he talks about um, all through there, um, grass is all burnt this day, um, only small unburnt places, um, small places that hadn't been burnt. Um, again and in December. So it appears that, oh, people carrying dry wood to make fire in the, in the grassy plains, grass burnt in several places, grass on fire, flames roar. This is into December. The end of December, um, grass is on fire. In January, again, uh, grass on fire. Um, grass still continues burning in the middle of January. Whoops, let me catch the corner of the page so I can turn it. Um, grass is raging still furiously, the 19th of January. This is not a time when we see lightning strike fires. These are clearly fires that, um, that are fires that have been lit. Um, in February as well, grass fires. Um, the plains lately burned um, into the middle of March. Um, I thought this, this was really compelling to hear these stories of, of fire again and again. We, um, oh. we also wanted to talk a little bit about missionaries because this was a place where the elders really described the collision of cultures that occurred, where the missionaries brought this notion of fire as being evil and associated with hell. And many of the elders talk about, um, you know, um, well, here's an interview with Tony and Cashola. We'll hear just a little bit of it. I remember it. when I was younger, that used to be one of the threats uh, by my grandparents, you know. They used to tell me if I didn't behave or if I didn't do this or if I knew that, I was going to go down to the fire. You know, and the fire... That's, that's a fairly different story than fire as a gift from the Creator brought by the animals. That's why we felt it was hugely important to produce this, um, this book. And this is a, um, a copy of the book. Can we pass it around, Johnny? People can look at it. Just don't read it, OK? Because we don't want Johnny to fly out of here today. <laughs> Whoops. Um, come here. Johnny, would you tell us? OK, well, it'll, I'll try and move through this a little bit, quick, a little bit quicker. Um, you know, it's interesting. I think the, the role that the railroads played has in, in fire and changing the landscape has really not been carefully examined. Most of the 1910 burns were started by a series of fires that began from sparks from the railroads. Um, so the coming of the new railroads really contributed to, um, to a high number of fires in, in this area. Um, we talk about... Um, the political landscape um, and treaty, the relationship between, um, again, fire and railroads. Um, and this is a long essay about removal of, of Bitterit Salish um, and the Swan Massacre, um, the, the ecology of violence, what happened when traditional practices were, um, were so, um, 
ref when cultural practices were uh, repressed by violence. We have a story about Salish and Pandre people that were, the, excuse me, Pandre people that were hunting across the international line in the in the um, late 1800s, and a party of them were shot and killed for um, making fires on the on the plains as they re they returned. So that's a fairly powerful disincentive to. Continue your traditional practice when you're when you're shot and killed for um, for something that's been a tradition. That's um, we can understand why um, why some of the changes occurred over time. Um, I've talked a little bit about the Great Burns, um, and I think that. I want to show you just a little bit of one of these early newsreels um, from the 30s. I think these are so interesting because it also talks about um, how important it was to suppress um, tribal use of fire. Um, fire was clearly the enemy. <laughs> the task of repairing past wastes and wisely using what is left. So it's pretty clear the rhetoric is, is highly charged. Um, it, fire was wasteful. It was destroying um, conservation efforts to protect water. It was, um, it was the enemy. And, um, and folks began to fight fire. Um, as the enemy. We went to war to fight fire. And we still talk about fighting fire. Um, and, and it's a little confusing for some people because on one hand, we fight fire, but then we also talk about prescribed fire and, and reintroducing beneficial fire. So um, I said this is, a, this is a confusing time when we're looking at the role of fire on the landscape and uh, how important it is. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, about fire management today. And these guys are so sophisticated in the way that they manage fire. And the prescribed burns, oh, I just love this because it's so fun. You know, this is the closest, this is as close as I get to a drip torch. So um, um, we've, okay, you guys laugh. I mean, <laughs> this is all about fire, you guys. <laughs> um, there is an um, incredibly, sophisticated process that goes into the evaluation of an area and describing an area before it's, before it's burned. Um, and we wanted to include a prescription here. Um, we wanted to talk about what happens when there's a, when there's a fire that's cited and reported. Um, how, how fire management responds to, um, to fire. We've also um, used a wildfire case study that Division of Fire provided us, and I'll let Tony talk about that a little bit when we finish up here. And this is really, I, I should have you move through this, Tony. Do you want to talk about this as I, yep. as I race through this? Yeah, <laughs> okay, here we go. Let me pass this on to you. Well, of course, the, the, the first illustration she showed was, uh, uh, Jermaine showed, was uh, uh, an example of a fire management plan. and. And we are a, a tribal uh, organization, uh, but it's uh, compacted through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So uh, we follow all interagency policy for uh, environmental protection and planning and, and fi national fire policy. So uh, we need a fire management plan to supplement our uh, forest management plan. And, uh, and w you know, we have to have a fire management plan that uh, uh, covers all acres of, uh, of burnable vegetation. and. And we only do our prescribed burning under approved burn plants. Okay. 
Yep. And we had some fire occurrence uh, uh, information there, uh, dec describes our uh, fire management zones. And uh, we didn't say it from the start, but uh, a lot of our description of, uh, okay. descriptions of uh, uh, fire management plans are, uh, uh, let's see, I forgot where I was at. Oh, okay, of, uh, of fire regimes and some of the science uh, is based on our fire management plan, which was, uh, it's uh, uh, several hundred pages in size, but uh, uh, we wanted to include fire education in the, uh, in the plan, and the plan is actually a, a, a very good read. It's, uh, uh, it has its technical parts, but it also has its illustrations and uh, uh, its definitions. Uh, you know, that can be uh, easily understood or, or, or translated into our, uh, our very various fire management uh, uh, applications and, and, and activities and things like that. So, uh, did you want to go back to the fire management section again? Uh, okay. You want, we talked a little bit about prescribed burns. Let's go to wildfires. Okay. Oh, we just did that. Let's talk about fire occurrence. Uh, based on a lot of uh, fire planning, uh, we at least have a, uh, a fairly good record uh, back to 1910 uh, that shows some of the larger fires, but more uh, specifically from 1980 to the present, uh, very good records involved with uh, how active uh, a fire is on, on our landscapes. Uh, and we also use this for uh, uh, budget development processes. Uh, also just flash through uh, 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 illustrations that show where the large fires have occurred over the last 25 years, uh, both on the reservation and off the reservation. Uh, you know, we have a big, very strong effect uh, of uh, our neighbors on the Lolo National Forest, and they, you know they're downwind from us, and uh, a large, a lot of those large fires that come across onto our landscapes. But uh, uh, you know, it shows the need for us to to work with our neighbors with initial attack and, and fire planning. And then uh, a little bit of history, uh, even other agencies are very proud of their, uh, the, the fire detection and fire lookout history and uh, the architecture and the historical significance. Uh, we still man three of four lookouts uh, with on, within the Flathead Indian Reservation and it's still a very uh, important part of our uh, our preparedness and uh, detection uh, system, and and we intend to maintain that. So, very good information there on some of the historical sites and the, the recently active uh, sites. So, okay. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. We're going to try and um, ask Johnny to come up and tell us a little bit about. Um, about his involvement in the story and in, in this project, and uh, and then we're going to leave a couple minutes for Q and A. Johnny, would you help us out, please? Thank you. Somewhere, can you hear me? Good. I should go like this. I'm <laughs> uh, well, my involvement is Domain, of course. She's always in there dragging people into work, and so she, she got me in there to uh, ask me if I would do a story. She gave me a little, I think a little cut out from a, an old story from a, some uh, person was collecting a long time ago, some historian or so was writing a story, but it was very short and cut off. And she asked me if I would do that story of Steel, Beaver Steel's Fire. And luckily that I had remembered some of that from a long time ago. A lot of our stories are, are very short now, cut, you know. We've lost a lot from time the missionaries came in, boarding schools and whatever, and, and it, when, it, when it wasn't popular to be Indian. So we've lost a lot of, a lot of our cultural ways. But uh, I remembered some of the stories, so this is where the uh, coyote story came out. And then we did a, a little video we had it done in two, two sections. One was all, all in Salish, and the other was all in, in uh, English. And we did this up at her place in a teepee in, in the winter, and it was a little chilly. So on a DVD, if you watch a DVD, you see a little steam coming out. 
once in a while maybe a little snowflakes coming from the inside that teepee up above. But uh, it was a lot of fun. We had some uh, little kids there sitting there. So uh, first I had to tell it in English so they can get the punchlines on it, you know. Because <laughs> <laughs> if I st started out with Salish, they would just kind of be looking at me. So we, we did it in English, got to the crazy parts, you know, the crazy parts to get them laughing. So then I go back and you give the facial expressions and all of that just to build up the story for the kids. And that's what the coyote stories were for, for, the, for the children. And behind his stories were morals that they would live by to understand what was happening. And the reason why we don't tell stories now after the thunder comes is one of the big warnings is that they say that if you told stories springtime, summertime or so, you may wake up with a snake in bed with you or toad or so. So uh, that was kind of the scare things about it. But basically, by telling stories at this time of the year, see the storytelling tell, time was just through the winter. We gathered our foods throughout the whole spring, summer, fall, and then we have all our provisions, then we're ready to st stay inside the teepee. We don't have to go out and hunt to get our food. We already have all our dry meat, our roots, and everything. So then comes the storytellers. Okay, so if we start telling stories now, it's gonna kinda disrupt nature, okay? So the birds are gonna be out there hatching the eggs and all of a sudden somebody's telling a story and say, ooh, so the birds gotta, yeah, I wanna listen in, I wanna see, you know? And something, some other people or other animals are doing something, you know? They're all preparing for the new season and, and all of a sudden they hear you telling the story, boy, they drop things and they wanna come and listen in, you know? So it messes up the whole progress of life, you know? The weather changes and finally gets cold, it's when it's supposed to be warm. So that's kind of the process of why you shouldn't tell stories during the, during the springtime, summertime, so it, it has its own time of season for storytelling. And I think that's my little involvement on it. Beaver steals fire. His little involvement is huge. <laughs> Johnny, why don't you stay here? Um, anybody have questions? That's kind of a quick, I know it's kind of fast and, and dirty, a quick overview of our project. And I'd love to show you this um, Beaver Steals Fire. I hope I'm invited to come in the winter time and, and show it because it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful, Johnny's storytelling. But um, I want, I think that that's, um, that's a little bit about our project. Does anybody have questions about, um, about the project for either Johnny or, or Tony? Pat. I, I, I see all this and I'm, it's, I'm impressed. But I'm wondering, what about the ants and the snakes and the, and the frogs and the vivians and all those sort of things with fire? You Do talk you, about we talk about and animals, but did, did you talk about We did, effects? we did. Let me show you the, let's go to the fire ecology. Let's go to fire effects on animals. Oh, let me, I'm sorry. I guess I could have clicked here. So when you look at fire effects on animals, we talked about um, we have shrews, bats. Um, we also talked about rodents, um, reptiles, amphibians. Um, uh, let's see. Ants or beetles or insects? You know, we didn't talk about insects. Dang. The, yeah, we talked about it's bats and shrews. Part of the, uh, food chain. It is. It is. Pat, you're in charge of that. Yikes. <laughs> we missed that part, but um, you know, unfortunately, um, we weren't able to do it all. This is just this is just an overview. Uh, the second question: I have, Did you include the traditional uh, flathead Salish uh, Kootenai uh, lands that go far down to? Darby, or is it just the current reservation? We did. We, um, we talked about in the land tenure section and um, the extent of Aboriginal territory, okay. we talked about um, what it was like before visitors and strangers came and before there was the movement from the eastern tribes to the west and um, you know the fur traders and trappers that arrived from the north and, and the pressure for, for tribes, the sort of domino effect that came when um, 
there were visitors and strangers came, that, that arrived and how, as a consequence of that, our, our land base changed over time. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Yes. Where do I uh, get some of this info from my uh, own personal library? Is that as SKC Bookstore? This yes, CD? it is. Well, you know what? This box of CDs arrived yesterday, so oh, I. Really um, new. Yes, okay. like this is hot off the press, yeah, brand spanking yeah. new. It's a photo finish. I was really anxious that we wouldn't <laughs> have them here in time. Um, I have the beta copy, but I, I didn't have the final product until yesterday. But the books are at SKC Bookstore. You can also go online and get them um, either at University of Nebraska Press or barnesandnoble.com. They, they have five, five more downstairs. Oh, and they have five more downstairs. Do you have DVDs for sale here? Um, you know, as I said, they arrived yesterday. So um, Tony is going to have some at Division of Fire. This project originally began as, um, as an education project. And I thought that it would be a project for reservation schools. And it was my primary interest to make it available to all the reservation schools. And then I got a request from NIFSI from the National Inter Interagency Fire Center for 200 copies, and I got uh, a request from the Northwest Regional Office in Portland for 100 copies, and of course our FMO wanted 50 copies. So at that point, we said, you know, we have to prepare these for distribution and marketing, which I know. Um, let me tell you how much I know about. I just wanted to talk about fire. I didn't want to talk about distribution and marketing. So, University of Nebraska Press said that. They would love to distribute and market this, and all we have to do is like hand it over to them, and they'll they'll market it. So, I have some copies here, but I haven't quite figured out how to do that. Jill, I'll make sure you get a copy. Yeah. Yes, Charles. Fair, fair, but normally, I think and if, you know someone if that firefighter or tribal people and they get blown all over the continent, even in Australia, and they won't put out fires. Yeah. How, how do you? Uh, I, th I think that's a really great point, Charles. Thank you for bringing it up. The question of, um, or the fact that tr uh, Indian firefighters have disproportionately served um, the nation, and it's it's this. I think that firefighters are like fire warriors, and um, our warriors have always fought in disproportionate um, numbers. This is this is our land. We feel a huge burden of responsibility to um, to step forward, and um, and I think that um, our fire warriors are are incredibly courageous and heroic when they go out and um, and try to ensure the the safety of of people's homes, um, to make sure that nobody loses their life or their home. Um, I, I I have tremendous. Uh, respect and regard for our fire warriors. And um, I don't know why they feel a burden. I don't know all the reasons. I mean, I know the reasons. I've worked with a bajillion. I think that's a real number, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Firefighters. And, um, and they have um, just stepped forward in, um, they know the landscape. They know the landscape. Um, I, I think that, and, they feel a burden of responsibility. I don't know, Johnny, you fought fires. D and Tony, you fought fires. Um, let, let's start with Tony. You probably have a better answer than I do. Uh, Chuck, probably another story to be told. Uh, I'm a third generation firefighter, and, and I can remember the stories. And, and my interest in fire came from my father and his stories about coming over to Columbia Falls in the Apgar area in 1927. And, and manning the fire lines for 10, 15 cents uh, an hour cash money at the end of the day. Uh, I think that's where a lot of natives probably got into uh, that firefighting uh, tradition because that was the management policy after 1910. Uh, it's a rite of passage for a lot of uh, uh, tribal youth. Uh, we have mixed crews where we have uh, you know, fathers on one crew and and mothers on another, and sons and daughters on other crews. Uh, I mean, it seems like a lot of the uh, tribal population, because of that history, at least takes their one summer to go out and fight fire for the experience and a rite of passage. We also have another story, though, on fire practitioners, 
and each agency is different there too. Uh, on the Flathead Indian Reservation, uh, there was pretty good uh, management emphasis in the early 60s to, to do some underburning similar to what was uh, occurring down in the Mescalero Apache and San Carlos uh, White River Apache areas. We're very envious of some of their past burning practices that have been in place for 40 or 50 years where they uh, aggressively return that fire on, on a historical interval. And uh, our management left in the 60s and we didn't continue to apply fire and it took us until the mid 80s to start back into that, uh, that progression or, or that management emphasis. So, so th there are stories to be told on all sides. They're involving Native Americans. Can I follow up with a question then? It seems to me like fire management is an oxymoron. And how does tribal policy now impact fire management in using some of this as a basis of understanding that it's important to have fires? Well, we used to be the fire control division, and some folks on the reservation still call us fire control. Um, you know, um, if we can put that emphasis and the education and other things on the fact of, of fire management, you know, that uh, uh, the understanding of, of policy of, of good fire and why we fight them and, and, and get this uh, new re-emphasized message of good fire, uh, that's where we're at within the context of fire management yeah. programs. So I, still have, I still have trouble with fire management like wildlife management. We're going to yeah. manage wildlife. Mm -hmm. in a better sense than we're destroying a lot of it. Same thing with fire management. We try to manage fire, but it's not the best yeah. way to do it. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand that we're doing that in, in complex uh, jurisdictions and ownerships and, and, and topographies. And we have the uh, class one air sheds and we have the wilderness where wildland fire benefits can really work. And it's needed in smaller areas, but, but it may not work, you know, across jurisdictional lines, so that's part of that, Steve, that whole subject. This valley being the land of smoke? Is it traditional? Not since the uh, pulp milk came out. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I remember reading some historical Salish information that this was well known as the valley of smoke. I don't know. You know, it, it, the smoke hangs right in here, you know? Yeah, yeah. Right. right in here, yeah. I notice when I come from, from Arlie, you know, in the wintertime, and if there's a storm, it just kind of clears the valley out, just nice and clear. And just very shortly, you see that mill out there. You see, you see that, where they say there's supposed to be no smoke coming, but it, you can see it just kind of coming to, by the hills, and all of a sudden, it just settles right here in the valley. And so all the people living in Missoula get punished for, you know, no fire, no firewood, you know? You can't build fires here. And it's not their fault, you know? It's a, up in the west there. But I don't know, but you know, I know it's always been hanging in here, the smoke. You know. yeah. There are still a couple of anomalies that bother me. Um, one is I, I really resent the forest service all of using smoking the bear. Yeah, this year's a smoking the bear. But then uh, I always tell folks that, uh, that, you know, fire and water both belong in the book. They're both are very important the forest. And, and you know, I think I'm fit with most of what was said here, except these hotshot crews that, you know, they, it's kind of like uh, the U.S. goes around propping up evil regimes in other countries, you know, and you go and fight somebody else's fire uh, that should have been, should have been let go. You know, there's, yeah. there's a bit of something that bothers me. I was just thinking about this morning when we started that prayer out, and then talking about the four elements, you know, air, water, fire, and Mother Earth. How all are getting destroyed in ways and misused, and, and fire will turn back and punish the people, you know, and by the misuse, the air is being thinned out, logging, cutting, and whatever else, the different pollutions in the air, cutting holes through the ozone, the shifting of the world around. Mother, Mother Earth is getting a little upset, and so it's getting 
a little little scary. It kind of follows too with a lot of the coyote stories and legends that predictions that the end of time is coming soon, very soon. And uh, I don't know if we can stop it or not, but we just have to get on our get on our different trails and hook a ride with whichever cultures we're going to and, and learn about our cultures and, and try to do the best we can to, to teach others. You're not going to be able to, to not everybody's going to believe you, you know. Not everyone's going to say, okay, but there's going to be some people that are not going to be believing. And this is what my great grandfather said, these are the people that are going to be left here on Mother Earth to be destroyed and the rest will be taken to the places of wherever the good land is at. Yeah, oh, yeah. I've been done. I don't know what I got it for. You, you <laughs> out on me. <laughs> I know. We have time for one last question, and then I've been asked to wrap it up. Um, I just want to say congratulations. It's, I think it's such a great tool, and it just overwhelms yeah. me how thorough you are. I think it's so great, and it's really attractive. And the different features, like turning the pages of the book, I just think it's really neat. Um, and you said originally you hope to use it for educational purposes. Is that still, I mean, how Absolutely. is it going to be used? Absolutely. Um, y you know, it's just a matter of scope. I am. What I thought was that we would finish this and we'd have a big giveaway and we'd give it to all the reservation schools. Um, unfortunately, there have been a few other folks that have asked for it too. So we've we've expanded our um, um, our thinking about how applicable it was. We felt that this place-based experiential learning tool would be of interest to folks maybe in the Northern Rockies that also had Salish um, other. Uh, stories that are very much like this and the same story for our, our sister bands. Um, but I, I didn't really fully appreciate that maybe other folks would find this interesting as well. So um, we're, we're uh, contact me and at uh, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes or Tony, you, you know, you can go to www.cskt.org and there's information there about our project and you um, the website is in, in development, and that should be up really soon, and that'll have um, a lot of this information as well. So it's just a big giveaway for education, and um, I'm hoping that we can distribute it widely as far as the interest goes. And yeah, uh, thank I think you. that interest will continue to, it'll be even more widespread than you think. I, mean, I do research on public attitudes about fire management, and a lot of our projects are here in the Northern Rockies, and so for me, this is really, I would love to, you know, I could benefit from it. I think there's tons of people <laughs> you don't even realize that will think it's really great. Uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate your, your comment. Are the proceeds going for a good cause? Oh, you know, and, and that's the other thing. You know, we, we talked about, hi there. We, we talked about distributing it. And um, the reality is that authors that, that produce a book, like this book that the tribes produced, get 10% so um, if we sell 5,000 of these, we'll maybe get a check for $500. The, the DVDs, we haven't set a price yet for marketing them, but we think that we'll be able to, because we've produced them and there's no publishing cost, we think that, that we'll be able to garner more revenues. And Tony and I are now negotiating whether or not we can have scholarships <laughs> for, um, we want to be able to make sure that we have enough money from the revenue that we can produce more if we need to. and then. It would be wonderful to have a scholarship program at Salish Kootenai College for an environmental studies um, student. But holy smokes, I don't even know if we're going to offload the <laughs> the um, the number of DVDs that we've produced. So anyway, it's quality content and quality product. You'll be scrambling to keep making more. Lester, and Lem to all of you. Thank you so much for for coming. I appreciate it. You guys were...